Why do Jews crutch so much? Story. Okay? A man boards a Chicago-bound train at Grand Central Station, sits down across from an old man reading a Yiddish newspaper. Half an hour later, the man puts down his Yiddish newspaper and starts to whine. Why am I thirsty? Why am I thirsty? Why am I thirsty? This goes on for a little while. The other man, growing impatient with the complaints of this elderly gentleman, gets up, fetches him a cup of water from the water cooler at the end of the car. He stops in front of the old man, clears his throat. <clears throat> the old man looks up, drains the water from the cup. He sits back relieved and allows himself a sigh of thanks. <gasps> he leans into a seat, tilts his head toward the ceiling, and says just as loudly as before, Oi, was I thirsty? Oi, was I thirsty? Now, it's supposed to be humorous. It didn't come from me. I took it from a very reputable source of Jewish humor. <laughs> Some people cannot let go. You have to ask yourself why. What is the investment in Kretschmer? Well, if we go back to biblical times, ancient Israel, the moment they set foot out of Egypt, the chorus of Kvetching began. Right? We come to service and hear the Torah reading. Muntik and Dornishtik, every step they take. A Kvetch about this, a complaint about this, a gripe about this. This is not good, that's not good. And it's interesting that, in, I quote this book, by the way, that you mentioned, uh, Born to Kvetch, very interesting insight. He says, Kvetching becomes a way of exercising some small measure of control over an otherwise hostile environment. It's an interesting psychological insight. In other words, when you feel entirely powerless, how do you feel against some control? You complain! As if to say, if I complain often enough, loud enough, convincingly enough, something's going to have to change. God's going to have to listen, the world's going to have to change, right? So Kvetching carries with it this kind of powerful communication. The problem is that fetching also reflects an attitude of victimization. Oh, right, poor me, I'm a victim. And the only thing I can do is fetch. And I want to let the world know that I'm a victim. And how do I do that? By fetching even more or even more loudly. And after a while, a sense of specialness starts to become attached to one's posture of victimization. Why am I important? Why do I have this special self-esteem? Because I'm such a victim. And very often people who have been objectively and, uh, and unfortunately and tragically victimized, it's not that they called it upon themselves, they were in fact uh, real objects, genuine objects of other people's hate, like the Jews, very often what happens sadly is that um, we start to unconsciously transform that position of victimhood into almost a national characteristic of great pride and uniqueness. And that can be very dangerous. It can be dangerous on an individual basis, it can be dangerous on a communal collective basis. Uh, not long ago I had a discussion about this topic uh, in my synagogue because I wanted to explore it with other people. I wanted a sense of a fuller clarification. I wanted to test some of the ideas I had. And um, I asked the congregation, why are Jews seemingly ungrateful? Why is it that they cannot be grateful? Why is it that they're always complaining and finding fault with one thing or another? And one fellow raised his hand in the back. I still remember this like yesterday. And he said, Rabbi, I can't feel grateful this to God. All I can feel is anger. Anger at God for allowing the Holocaust to happen. He was the son of a Holocaust survivor. And all he could feel is his anger. And for a moment, he cannot allow the feeling of gratefulness for whatever he has accomplished, for the survival of his father. 
the anger is so profound because of being persecuted for so long. Now, we have fixated on our tragedies for a long time, and it's understandable, historically understandable. But Salo Baron, who is the great Jewish historian, made a wonderful point when he said that we have for much too long um, carried with us the notion of the lachrymose conception of Jewish history. In other words, we think of our history as being a veil of tears. You want to know Jewish history? You want to understand Jewish history? It's tragedy and tears. He says that's been going on too long. A people cannot creatively thrive and survive from this kind of perspective. And what he said basically is, in the same breath, he said that for Jewish history to emerge as a source of inspiration to Jews and to the world at large, it has to be one that is seen as a proud and creative history, one for which the Jewish people should be grateful. And I quote Baron in using that word, grateful. A statement from the Torah, which to me is powerfully, powerfully um, revealing and dramatic. There is a long list of punishments that is reiterated, that are reiterated in one of the um, in one of the uh, um, the segments of the Torah, and. Um, what parsha is it, uh, Rabbi Tanabam? The uh, Chukotai, the Chukot, the Tochecha, the Tochecha, right? The Tochecha, which is words of admonition directed at the Jewish people, and um, it talks about the most tragic, the most horrendous kinds of responses that would befall the Jewish people uh, if they behave in a certain way. They will be cursed. I want to share with you one phrase. It's in Deuteronomy also, not only in the Chukotai, but it's also in um, um, Deuteronomy 45, <laughs> which is uh, uh, Kitavo. Okay. All these curses shall befall you. They shall pursue you and overtake you and wipe you out. Now listen to this admonition. I mean, we're thinking about a kind, gentle, compassionate God. These are very harsh words. They shall serve as signs and proofs against you and your offspring for all the time because you would not serve the Lord your God in joy and gladness over the abundance of everything. What was the sin of ancient Israel? Not that they desecrated the Shabbos. Not that they committed idolatry, although all those things are pretty sinful and pretty, pretty drastic. But what is the reason for God's wrath, so to speak? The reason for tohecha, for admonition, for recrimination, you did not serve the Lord your God in joy and gladness, i.e. in gratitude, in gratefulness. In other words, what you did when you came to pray every morning is you had your sight directed on what's wrong. And you persisted in reiterating before God, this is wrong, and that is wrong, this one's sick, and this one doesn't have enough parnasa, and I'm not succeeding in this, and, and this one, uh, I had a relationship with, and she left me, and he left me, all the litany of all the wrongs. Well, one Buddhist uh, uh, monk suggested that, you know, instead of, when you pray in the morning, instead of um, repeating to God what's wrong, why don't you share with him what is not wrong? Maybe that will have a very different kind of impact on you as a worshiper. Maybe you should spend time while you pray on all the things that are right in your life. Maybe you should find a way by which you can serve God in joy and gratefulness.